back, Tuesday nighters. Here we go. It's time on our Tuesday night to lift up the Lord. Let's worship.
strongholds will break Every weapon that falls will shatter and fail He is our God, He is our faith Praise is the highway to the throne of God Praise is the highway to the heart of God Praise is the highway up your head, fling wide the gates, break down the walls with a shout of praise, lift up your voice, pull heaven down, or oh, sing like thunder, His praise is aloud, or oh, lift up your head. Good evening and welcome to another service here with us at Refuge Christian Fellowship in our One Sure Way Bible Study, going through the life of Elijah with Pastor Howard. It's been an amazing time and I hope that you have enjoyed it and have been absolutely blessed by it. You may be joining us live with a watch party or you may be watching this study throughout the week because you're going to have those options. We are so excited. We have heard such great things and we're so glad that you're with us. This is one of those ways that you can look for those opportunities to serve in your neighborhood to your, for your family and um, your, your church body. You know, basically Jesus Christ and being available for Him. So we're so glad if that's how you're joining us. And if this is something that you think you can do, we want to show you how easy that is. Just let us know and we'll help you get set up. 
Now, we just want to make sure that you're staying connected through the summer. Women, we've been talking about our book, Mountain of Spices. I think we're just about done. If you're not, just keep reading. We'll get together here very, very soon, as soon as we determine what's going on. We can't wait to get together and talk about this as a book club. We hope to provide an opportunity where you can bring your kids. Maybe we can go to the beach, have a pool party, something. But don't you worry. Just hang in there. Enjoy your book. Enjoy the reading. Stay in the Word. Ladies, I love you, and I can't wait to get back together with you guys in some way, shape, or form. Men, Pastor Howard's been talking about this. I know Mario, Eddie, a bunch of guys are really looking forward to getting together. So stay posted, stay tuned in, and we'll let you know what that's going to look like because I know that they're really looking forward to have that connection and that interaction as men again. Next thing we do to stay connected here at Refuge is we have a corporate prayer time on Saturday mornings. Again, we talk about it all week long. It's our mantra, pray, 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 call someone else and pray with them, call someone else and pray with them, get together, stay connected. This is how we're doing it, but it's just been a blast. I'm just so excited that we get to do this and have church together. We are not separated by anything. The other thing I want to let you know and remind you is that we are here for counseling. We are here for prayer. We are here for fellowship. If you need that, please let us know. We will figure out what works best for you and for us to try and meld that together and come together as a family in one way or another. So with all of that said, we just want you to enjoy the study. We think it's timely. We are so blessed to have you here and we love you. God bless you guys. Some of us might be wondering what we're going to do next. Maybe you got some bad news and you're not quite sure how to step up, how to deal with it. I want you to know that, that God makes rivers in the deserts. He can part seas and make them dry land. He can feed through ravens. And he can bring light where there was once darkness. He will provide a way for you. At the same time, I want to thank you for participating with us in the ministry. You make what we do possible. are here moving in our midst worship you I worship you you are here working in this place worship you I worship you because you are way maker miracle worker Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you Cause you are way maker, miracle worker Promise keep light in the darkness My God, that is who you are You are way maker, miracle worker Promise keep light in the darkness My God, that is who you are you are here, you're turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you. Cause you are way maker. Miracle work, promise keep 
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are living, miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. All right, it's Tuesday night again, Refuge Christian Fellowship. I want to talk to you this evening about becoming the change that you want to see happen in your own life. Doesn't that sound weird? I want to talk to you about you becoming the change that needs to happen in your life. Elijah and Elisha, that's what we've been looking at since COVID started. You ask anyone who's the heavy hitter of all heavy hitters when it comes to the Old Testament prophets, and you always get the same answer. Of course, it's Elijah. You'll hear very little about Elisha, but everybody talks about Elijah. Elijah burst on the scene supernaturally and suddenly. Elijah, he kind of grew into his role. I actually, when I first started reading all this, and you know, and as a young believer, I, I confused the two. I thought Elijah was Elijah and Elijah was Elisha, but I find out that they're, they're two different people and that they came onto the scene in different ways. Elisha, he spent 10 years doing nothing but serving Elijah. And so they didn't have Bibles back then. They, they had scrolls and they had prophets, but they didn't have Bibles like, like you and I have today. They, didn't, they, didn't, they couldn't carry these around. They, there were you know, select people that were the prophets who were actually the walking, living, breathing, uh, basically examples of, uh, it was as good as living with the word of God. If you lived with a prophet of God, you were living with the word of God. You had communication with heaven. And he lived for 10 years. Elisha lived for 10 years under that authority. At the end of it, that 10 years, he was asked by Elijah, he asked him, what, what do you want me to do for you before I'm taken away from you? And Elijah, he asks a great, uh, asks for a great thing. He asks that he would have a double portion of his spirit be upon him. That double portion simply meant that position that he occupied, the power that he possessed, and the purpose that he walked in. He wanted twice as much as as Elijah. And guess what? God answered. God answered his request. He stayed close to the man of God, which is like staying close to the word of God. 
it's, there's an overwhelming blessing available to all of us who stay close to the Word of God. The Word of God and being in there for 10 years prepared Elisha for the, for the role that God had him to walk in. And so we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 4, just seven verses tonight, but be, remember what I said. I always say it before we head in, let's head up. Let's pray. Father, we ask that once again, you would bless this, our Bible study, that your hand would be upon every heart, every ears, every eye, Lord, that all of it would work in harmony, that would be free to hear you. Lord, we ask that you'd bind the hand of the enemy that would keep us from any distraction. And now we want to focus in like laser beams on what you have for us. Lord, speak to us. Lord, overlook my own inadequacies. And Father, I ask that you would uh, just, <laughs> that the meditations, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. So take me, use me, and bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Kings 4, picking it up in verse 1. This is where we read, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elijah saying, your servant, my husband is dead and you know that your servant feared the Lord and, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slave. Well, this is about as pathetic as it gets. This is desperate in 2 Kings 4. It's a desperate place and a desperate time. You can see from this woman, the death took her means of support, her only means, her husband, and the debt took her future and despair took her heart because the creditors were going to take her sons. So she went to the prophet. She went to the word of God. Listen, God has the answers that you need in this book if you're willing to look into it. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. God is here even now and ready to speak into your life. All one has to do is simply open up the book and read, and that's what we're doing tonight. Look at verse two. Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Now, Elijah, can you imagine? What do you got in the house? What's in the fridge? What do you have? Imagine that you're this woman, you're flat broke, the cupboards are bare, the only means of support just died, and you're about to lose your kids. By the way, your kids were your future in their, in their economy, in their sociological structure. Think about that question again with me. What do you have? Doesn't that sound like a ridiculous question? Look at verse two, look at it again. So she said, your, mer your maidservants has nothing in the house but, everybody underline that word, but, a jar of oil. Nothing but a jar, and I love that, but, but. See, she's done the inventory and she knows exactly what she's got and she knows that everything she has is not enough. I wanna say that again. She knows that everything she has is not enough. And the only thing of value that she has is a jar of of oil. Nothing in the house, but that's what she does. She does inventory. I mean, we do that all the time. I would like to do this, but I, I, I'd like to accomplish this, but man, if I'd only, you know, we, we have regrets, but what she doesn't know when she says nothing in the house, but what she doesn't know is that God always blesses what you have. So use the jar. Uh, let me just say it to you. God will always bless what you have if you're using what you've got. And we, all of us, are only limited by the buts in our lives. God can turn your buts into blessings if you're willing. See, when death, debt, and despair flow into your life, when they visit you in power and strength to tear you down, we usually focus, when that happens, we usually focus on what we've lost or what we don't have not on what we have. All we know is when we focus on what we have, the one thing we can be sure of is we don't have enough. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough respect. We don't have enough friends. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough credit. I don't know what it is, but all I know is that when we do inventory, we always end up saying, well, you know, it's, it's just not enough. 
I don't know about you, but I know uh, a number of women. I've raised uh, three of them, and, and I, I happen to know uh, a few women, and, and I know that, uh, I don't know if you've ever encountered this. I know some uh, people have, that when they're ready to go out to dinner or they're ready to go out to church, they, they'll, they'll watch the wife or, or look in the closet. And, you know, maybe they have enough in the closet to clothe an entire, um, an entire Haitian village if, if they wanted. And there's shoes and clothes and racks, a lot of clothes, a lot of shoes. And still, when it comes time to get ready, you hear inevitably these words. I've got nothing to wear. <laughs> I've got nothing to wear. Stop waiting around for what you want. Start working with what you've got. Stop waiting around with, for what you want. Start working with what you've got. That's the number one point. See, because God is really good at working with nothing. I mean, if you think about it, when he fed the 5,000, there were only there were five loaves, five barley loaves, which are quite small. And then it says this in John 6, 9. And he had two small fish. It came out of a little kid's lunch bag. Uh, five barley loaves and, and two small fish. Think about this. He was able to feed 5,000 with five barley loaves, two small fish. How about David? He had five stones to take on a giant. I mean, when you think about it, what has God placed in your hands? What do you have in your hands? What has God put there? I'm not talking about anything monetary. Let, let me ask you, what passion is in your heart? What possession, what gift is in your hands? What proficiency do you possess? What are you good at that is a God-given gift? How about this? What do you love? What do you have? And what can you do? Every one of us has something, some passion, some possession, some proficiency that we can use. So use it. Elijah's answer is incredible. Look at it in verse 3. I'll pick it up in verse 3. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, <laughs> from all your neighbors. He goes on, uh, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. They, he wanted them to go all out. And when he said, when you've come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons and then pour it into all those vessels and set it aside, set aside the full ones. He just said, set aside the full ones. We don't know if we're going to have empty ones or full ones. Set aside the full ones. I want you to start thinking thick, thicker, not thinner. I want you to think bigger, not smaller. I want you to realize that we serve a great God. When in Luke 5, Jesus told the disciples, cast out your nets on the other side of the boat. They were in the shallows. It wasn't a pick, typical place to, to fish like that. And as a matter of fact, the sun was too high in the sky and every fisherman knows you gotta, you gotta get them in early in the morning or in the evening. And, 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 but he said, cast your nets on the other side. It seemed ridiculous, but it almost sunk all the boast. When he was feeding 5,000, we know that if you had 5,000 men, that's what the scriptures say, there would have been more. There would have been men and women and, and kids. There could have been 15,000 people there. And, and there were 12 baskets left over because they were willing to use the two small fish and the barley loaves to do what God had called them to do. Let me remind you that small thinking Small thinking is fear thinking. It means, small thinking means, I don't want to lose what I have. I want to hang on to what, you, what I've got. Small thinking me leads to small living. M you'll miss out on the life that God has intended for you to live with small thinking, with thin thinking. I love what James Allen, he wrote in his book, um, uh, just spaced on the title of the book. The book is... Uh, as a man thinketh in his heart. Um, he said this, all that a man achieves and all that he fails to achieve is the direct result of his own thoughts. 
I want you to think bigger. Ephesians 3, 20, to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us or Philippians 4, 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Or maybe the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or as it's translated in the NIV, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Small thinking leads to small living. In Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 and 25 from the message, check this out. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. Thin thinking leads to thin living. See, you've got to have a more than enough mentality. God has more than enough to supply what you need. As a matter of fact, I found a UC Berkeley study on the positive effects on givers. And this is what they wrote in page three of that study. Many studies point to the possible positive consequences of generosity for the giver. Giving social support, time, effort, or goods is associated with better overall health in older adults. And volunteering is associated with delayed mortality. So you will have a healthy life, a healthy personality, a healthy relationships. Your relationships will be healthy. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 25, Jesus himself said, it is better to give than to receive. That means a life that is living is a life that is giving. A life that is getting is not a life that is living. It's just simply absorbing. You've got, God has given you so much, use what you have. And as a matter of fact, that's usually about a time like this if you're watching and you're thinking, okay, here it comes, the big money pitch. Listen to me, this isn't about money. This is so much bigger than money and what you're getting from me today is absolutely free. We're giving it to you. Generosity is a state of mind, not a matter of money. If, if you get your head into the fact that generosity me, can be meted out in so many different ways, I was thinking about this in my own life and I thought of a perfect example of this. Pastor Rick Hone is the guy's name. He, is, uh, he was born with cerebral palsy. One of the things that happened was that the doctor made a mistake when he was being born and uh, some things happened. I, I, as I heard, I, you know, I, I think it was Rick who said that the doctor was actually intoxicated at the time and, and he, it was a miracle that he even lived. But he's bound to a wheelchair. He can't communicate. He's extreme cerebral palsy. And he uses his chin to, to communicate on a board that he helped develop. <laughs> the technology is amazing. And on top of that, he's a painter. And this is what he said when he's talking about his paintings. He said this, sometimes I sit back in utter amazement at my artwork. I have to ask myself if I really did these paintings. They amaze me because with the cerebral palsy, my head jerks, but they are, but they're, they, but they are still there, a reminder of the miracles through the Lord working through me. I'm going to show you that picture, hoping they're bringing it up. It's a beautiful picture. He painted that with his chin and a special bracket that somebody helped place there. See, somebody was being generous and he was responding in generosity. As a matter of fact, he went to college. He was a psychology major. He's an ordained minister of the gospel. He's an evangelist. He's a motivational speaker. He's a consultant, an author, and an artist. I mean, here's a man who has been relegated to a wheelchair, a motorized chair that he can only control with slight movement for his entire life. And he never responded to his limitations, what he couldn't do, but he focused like a laser on his abilities and that he did what he could. I want you to use that truth in your life 
and use what you've been given and work with what you have and allow God to ignite it when you do it in his name. Look at verse five. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and, and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. See, it proves the point. See, they didn't understand. They didn't have to understand. See, you don't have to get it to have it. She did what she was told to do. She didn't offer up 20 questions. She didn't try to you know, get it all worked out in her mind. And this is the glorious truth. I'm so grateful for this truth. This truth has fueled my life. Obedience does not require your understanding. I mean, Abraham, when he left Ur the Chaldees, he went on a journey. He didn't know where he was going. When you think about Mary visited by the angel Gabriel, you're going to give birth to God. She's, she says, I don't understand how this can be, but it's your word. She simply just let it be so. The disciples, in the same breath, they were clueless most of the time. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians there in the second chapter, I didn't come with you to you with wisdom and eloquence of speech but in much fear and trembling, so that your confidence would be in the power of God, not in the wisdom of men. See, it doesn't take a genius to receive. If you want to receive, just simply do what he's asking you to do. And, and by the way, this is another great truth. I can't believe I'm sharing all this with you tonight. It's amazing. Uh, obedience doesn't require understanding, but get this. Obedience, we think that obedience is going to uh, move God to bless us. Obedience doesn't move God. Obedience moves us. When we're obedient, we are allowing ourselves to be in a position to be blessed. See, ob obedience moves you into position and your position brings in the reception. Obedience moves you into position and the position brings in the reception. I can't I was thinking about this as well. I remember being in my grandfather's house there in Pierpont, Ohio, and this is years ago, but it was back in the day when they had those huge satellite dishes. Remember that? They were like a huge satellite dish. And I remember being there when they were installing this thing. He's out in the middle of nowhere in Pierpont, Ohio, out in the middle of farm fields, but he wanted to get TV, and through a satellite, he could get 200 channels, and so he, I was watching the guy, and you know they had to turn that satellite and set it up to aim it into the right hemisphere to get on and lock in to the right satellite that was traveling in synchronous orbit around the Earth. And the action of moving the satellite activated the picture. The action activates, remember that, I remember, you remember James, uh, when he wrote in James chapter two, there in verse 17, faith without works is dead. I love the way the NIV translated it. <laughs> faith by itself is not, a, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. See, God doesn't want anything from this woman or her sons. He wanted something for them. God doesn't want anything from you. He wants everything for you. And obedience puts you into the position to receive that. Can you imagine the scene as they pour the oil? As they're looking down and they pour the oil and they set it down, this one's full, and then they grab another one and they pour again and they set it down and they grab another one and they pour, get more jars, get more jars as they pour and fill and pour and fill. Faith began to grow as the jars began to fill. Once they started pouring, the Lord started providing. That's how it works. And now they have a huge problem. The huge problem isn't the limitations of what they have. The problem is they need more jars. In Luke 6, 38, Jesus said this, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your heart, into your bosom. For with the same manner that you give, it will be measured back to you. This is a principle that has outlived all of us. I love the way the message puts it in Luke chapter six in verse 38. Give away your life. You'll find life given back, but not merely given back given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting is the way. Generosity begets 
generosity. If you have a need, well, you plant the seed. And as the old Pentecostal preacher would say, the Lord can't get it to you unless he can get it through you. Let's look again at verse six. We pick it up in verse six, and that's where we read. Now it came to pass um, when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another vessel. And, and so the oil ceased. Bring me another vessel, get more jars. They run, hey amen, I want you to hear this. They ran out of jars before God ran out of oil. I mean, think that through. They ran out of jars long before God ever ran out of oil. God has a limitless supply and he's looking for empty vessels to fill. Are you willing to open yourself up and say, fill me, Lord? And then once he does that, are you willing to use what you have for generosity's sake, for Christ's sake? I mean, look at verse seven. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil, pay your debt, and your sons, you and your sons will live on the rest. See, God met the need to pay the debt. I don't know if you see it, but look again. He provided so that they could live free. He wanted them to be free. That's what God wants you to be free. He wants them to be free, not for freedom's sake, but that they might put freedom on display so that a world in bondage might see what liberty looks like. The church needs to begin to grasp this concept. It's not about the churches we attend. It's about the God that we serve and the fact that he is able to fill and to work and to bless anything that you give him. This is amazing. He just talks jars. I mean, jars, empty jars. They're no good unless something's in them, but he wants the empty jars. See, now they're free to live and they're <laughs> living to put freedom on display. No matter how hopeless your situation is tonight, I want to give you at least a little direction. Here it is. Follow the plan. <laughs> no matter how hopeless things are. I want you to follow, discover the plan and follow it. I got a point to ponder for you. I want to ask you, how did this woman get into this mess? I, I get her husband died, but how did she end up in this kind of mess? Look at verse one. Look at verse one again. It says, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband is dead and you know that your servant feared the Lord and the creditor, underline that, and the creditor is coming to take away, take my two sons to be his slave. A creditor walked up. I know you're going through hard time, lady, but you know, I can help you get through that. Yeah, he offered her a shortcut. In Proverbs 22, in verse 7, we read these words. The rich rules over the poor. And is that not the case even to this day? The rich rules over the poor and the, borrow, the borrower is servant to the lender. Servant, ebed is the word. And it means a slave. He's a slave. You know, debt is such bondage. I know it. I know it all too well. Been down this road too many times to count. That debt is bondage. That they always sell credit as something that you can help. I mean, any store that you go to, even now, they'll give you 10% off your bill if you fill out a credit card. You can have the car you want when you want it. All you have to do is sign your life away for it. And so you'll be like one of the seven dwarfs. Instead of saying, hi ho, hi ho, it's off to work. You're going to say, I owe, I owe. So it's off to work. I got to go. Imagine what you could do if you were debt free. Imagine what were possible if you didn't have the obligation of paying that bill every month. I'm sure if you could really think about it, you'd say, man, I wish I could man, I would like to do this, or I would like to help out there, or I'd like to do more. I'd like to maybe take a trip. I would, I would like to be able to be, you know, go on a mission trip. I want to go to Israel. I want to, I, want to take a, I want to take in what God is calling me to be. I wish I could do it, but gosh, I can't. I, I owe, I owe. It's off to work, I go. 
Uh, we had this last year, and uh, I want to encourage you. We're going to do it again, so keep in tune. But they have this thing called Financial Peace University. Dave Ramsey is the guy's name, Dave Ramsey. And he's the one who teaches the 10, 10, 80 principle. 10, the first fruits, goes to God. That's, that's for God. That is your service to him. 10% of your earnings goes to him. 10% of, your, of what you earn, you put away. You put away for yourself. You do whatever. And 80%, now you have to work with. 80%, you could put 10% away, you get the 10% from God, 10% for your retirement, you can put it away, make a nest egg. 80%, you can do what you want with that money. If you're waiting and wanting, you're in a tough spot. And if you're in a tough spot and you're waiting for that change, I wanna teach you how to become the change. Number one, work with what you've got instead of looking for what you want. Number two, I want you to think thicker, not thinner. Small thinking leads to small living. And then number three, follow the directions. Discover your place and God's plan and purpose for your life and ultimately follow the directions because all of the directions are intended to move you closer to the greatest blessing in a relationship with your Savior your creator, your redeemer. See, this is the whole point for the good news. See, God actually, God likes you <laughs> and wants you to know why and what he's done to make your future glorious and possible. See, that's why Jesus came. He, he gave the ultimate, God gave the ultimate gift John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave Jesus. And so when he gave Jesus to the world, the world rejected him. And yet they did not know that he was burying all of the rejection, all of the pain, all of the torment, all of the hunger and disease and lack. And he carried it for us all the way to the cross. And then what he did with our despair, with our discouragement, with our <laughs> sidetracks and losing our direction, what he did is he carried it all the way to the cross and then he nailed it there for you and I that we might know him, that we might have an opportunity to see God do amazing things with what we have that we might have an opportunity to get beyond the limitations of our own thinking and live bigger. And then through that, we have directions that we can follow and a Holy Spirit that can lead us through that, discovering our place and our purpose in life. Finally, there's one thing that God really challenges people in, in life. I want to read to you from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. The prophet said to a church that had gone cold, that it had lost its way, that had nothing but discouragement and disappointment and disillusionment, and they were completely derailed in life. And he said to them, he said this, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. That's what God is saying. And try me, God says, now in this. If I will not pour open for you the windows of heaven and pour out, I love that he used the word pour out like a oil out of a pitcher, pour out for you such blessing that there will not be enough room to contain it, to receive it. In other words, more jars, <laughs> more jars. Hey, listen, if you got the jars, God's got the oil. Oh, you can be the change that your world needs if God's in it. God bless you guys. I'll talk to you again next week. I can't wait. I can't wait to share some more of this with you. In the meantime, go with him. Work with what you've got. Think big 
and follow the directions and <laughs> walk with him. God bless you guys. I'll see you next week. Oh, love.